What was the reaction in your community about a single Muslim? The website was seen as evil. I mean, let's just be frank about it because there was only one thing at that time that online was being used for and that was Viewers and listeners, Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to another episode of Side by Side and I'm your host, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. Why don't I design a website to uh, buy myself a wife? Probably the, the most desperate thing that <laughs> anybody has ever done, but Desperate I'm but innovative as well. Our guest today, the one and only Adin Yunis, the founder of Single Muslim. Stood by my father's coffin and my auntie looking down at me and screaming and saying, what is going to happen with you now? <clears throat> Session with the uh, <laughs> shrink, isn't it? <laughs> is it generally men or women that kind of, you know, <laughs> mess around <laughs> on the platform? Like, you know, what's the percentage? It has changed massively. You would not believe it. And now it's pretty much 50-50. Wow, that is, that is madness. <laughs> Brother Adim Yunus, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam. KSR, as it says <laughs> in your tie, mashallah. That's when you know you've made it. When you've got, uh, no, 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 no. you got a tie with your own initials on there, man. That's, I like that. I like that. No, no, no. I'm learning. I'm learning from people like yourself. <laughs> so, just to kind of uh, summarize our research. So, you founded um, your Go Web Print business at the age of 17. Uh -huh. That's correct, right? And then you went to set up a restaurant in uh, Wakefield. Wow. Not many people know about wow, it. Wow, wow, wow. Um, famous for chocolate curry. Wow, your research is a good man. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to say credit for I it. I thought it's, that it's was the history books, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then you found a single Muslim in yeah. the year 2000. Yeah. Um, obviously, we'll try and uh, we will we'll discuss a lot about single Muslim and how that came about. Okay. And then, of course, uh, Penny Appeal came about in 2009. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got many other ventures not many people know about, but I guess that's your private matter between you and your, I guess, shareholders. So to begin the show... I'm, try I'm trying to catch it with you. The number... <laughs> so we've... we've so um, just to begin the show, I'm going to ask you one question. Okay. And maybe you are, you are ready for it, maybe you're not. What is your greatest fear? And that, that could be anything. My greatest fear? Wow. Um, I think that's a big, that's a, that's a deep, that's a deep question, man. That's a deep question. Was this from your researchers as well? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I guess my greatest fear in the context of what you're saying here is, uh, is failure. You know, you don't want to fail, but then you're not, you don't know what your, you don't know what that what's out there either. So I really go hard and I drive hard when it comes to creating something. And you don't really create. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I've, I've followed your journey as well. You don't really create anything because you know it's going to be a success, but you don't go somewhere and you know to fail either. You go. So you you go into a into a place. You go into a location. You go into a an organization, a business to succeed. And you take all your resources with you, you know, you, 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 you burn the ships, as they say, in terms of making sure that you're, you're able to make it, make it work. Where does that fear come from? Where does that fear come from? Um, like uh, having a session with the uh, <laughs> shrink, isn't it? <laughs> I think that fear maybe comes from... Um, that's a deep question. That's a deep question. And I'll tell you where that fear comes from. I'll tell you where that fear comes from. Wow. Um, that fear comes from when I was a child, when I was six years old. And I know this because I've, because of some of the work that I've done um, with people on, on the journey. Uh, and it comes from stood by my father's coffin in our mid-terraced house in Wakefield and my auntie looking down at me and screaming and saying, what is going to happen with you now? <clears throat> so she's looking up at God, looking up at the ceiling, looking up at God and saying, God, why have you done this? Why have you done this? What, what is this boy going to do? He's only six years old. You've taken his father away from him and now he's going to have nothing. He's got nothing. And what will he be doing? 
And I think after that time, you know, a lot of people, when I was younger, a lot of people looked at me and a lot of people dealt with me and they said to me, you know, when, when, you, when you're a child, you're in a room and they say, oh, who so-and-so, who so-and-so, who so-and-so. And people would say, look, he's, um, he's Eunice's son, but not that Eunice that works in the mill and not that Eunice that works at the, uh, at the taxis, the Eunice's son who's passed away. And because my father had passed away, I'd, I'd somehow earned the title, I'd earned the, the kind of like um, the position of special treatment. So they'd come, you know, come here, son, pat me on the head, give me 50 pence, give me a pound or something. And next time they'd see me, they'd maybe bring some toys or some books or something. And it was nice because, you know, the, the community was, a, it was, it was beautiful. But I guess, I guess that's where the fear comes from, where you just don't want to be dependent or you don't want to be, you don't want to be relying on, on, on other people and you don't want to be a failure because that's what was expected of me, I guess. And, I, and, and that's what everybody in the community kind of almost thought was kind of a designated sticker that you will fail because you don't have a father. So did your father pass away, pass away at a quite young age? Very young age, age, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old was he? Late 20s. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would Allah you mind sharing he had, he a had, bit he around had, he had, why, uh, how? He had, he had bowel cancer. And uh, it was back in those days, you know, it wasn't 35 years ago, 36 years ago. It wasn't something that was easily diagnosed. And were you the only child at that time? There was three. I've got two younger siblings, two younger sisters. Yeah, so three. So they must have been quite really young. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So four and two. So you're yeah. the eldest in the family. I'm the eldest of three. I'm the eldest boy. Yeah. So, so did you f- did you kind of find yourself taking that leadership role at a very young age when your father passed away? Um, yes and no because you know I had uncles around. I had a grandfather there, so my mum's father was w- moved in with us. Uh, I had my mum, so my mum's brother lived next door and then another one of our mamus living a, a few doors down so the community was very very close and it was a very small community and it was a community that looked after itself and the family was a strong strong family alhamdulillah so um yeah we had a lot i had a lot of uh, good role models around i had a strong family around so yes and no you know you have to take the the position and you have to almost yeah you, you kind of take a a fatherly role for my youngest siblings. So wh- where was your father from? I mean, in terms of from, ethnicity. From, from Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And was, was he born here as well in this country? <laughs> so sorry if it feels no, no, like, no, 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 no. like an interview. Uh, I'm just trying to kind of, of uh, course, uh, draw a picture. <laughs> yeah. So my fa- my mum and dad were both born in Pakistan. Uh, they born and raised in Pakistan and they came here as teenagers and they got married here uh, in, in, in Wakefield. Um, and then, they, you know, it was a pretty normal life uh, I'd worked in the factory. Uh, he had these. Uh, in fact, we looked. We we found it uh, last year. We found his taxi badge um, in the attic, and uh, sadly, he, you know, it was quite a big achievement for him to to start driving taxis. But he never drove taxi because he he passed away. No, no, no. Um, but I you mean, know, you know that that generation, as you know from your your family as well, it's it's an Im- immigrant mentality, and I think we still have that immigrant mentality. And our generation is the last of that generation. To, to have that kind of mindset, it literally is to work hard, to work out every hour that God's given you. Um, to Alhamdulillah, you know, we, we are very, very grateful, but we see some of what we're doing, some of our responsibilities, not just here with us as individuals, but going back to our, our kind of ancestral home, going back to, you know, where our family's from and, and helping back there as well. So, you know, um, with entrepreneurs generally, um, they have a kind of a moment in their life that triggers them to be, that that pushes them to want greatness, to achieve something. And for me, it was um, when we were coming to England and um, I think we stayed in a quite a cheap hotel. And then as we were going down the next morning on the way to the airport, and I think some ladies, I mean, they were posh, in the capital city and obviously they kind of looked at us as if we we're like going to an orphanage because that's how kind of malnourished <laughs> we probably looked like um so 
they asked my father, who looked like a Mulvi, big beard, you know, hat and everything, and she said, which orphanage are you taking them to? No way. And then wow. um, my father kind of responded in English. He knew, like, kind of how to angle it, so he kind of responded in English, oh, they're going to London. Yeah. And they just kind of shut up, and, <laughs> and, 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 and we went our way. And I, I still remember that, that kind of moment, and I think when I kind of became more, more of an adult, yeah. I, I remember those kind yeah, of moments yeah, yeah, and it yeah. kind of added yeah. so much fuel to the fire. Do you have any incidents that kind of really kind of reminds you to kind of want to succeed? I think just watching my mum really work hard and the determination that she had uh, as a young widow. Um, she learned how to drive to take us to school, to take us to the best school in our area. Uh, she learned how to sew. She learned how to uh, do piecework. Then she she opened up a, a market stall. Then she opened up a retail stall. Just as you guys have got, you know, in terms of so we had a uh, a retail shop on Brook Street, which is in the town centre of Wakefield. So watching her work and work hard, man, you know, like work like twenty four seven, like get up and work hard, take us to school, do our homework, make sure that we had enough money for trips, make sure that we had clothes that were like everybody else's clothes that, you know, we had packed lunches, we could afford small little breaks like everybody else. So it was really determined to make sure that we, you know, and she said to us often as well, like, you know, I'm your mum, but I'm also your dad. And I don't want anybody to say that you don't have a father. And, and I, you know, you look up and you think to yourself, mm, okay. Because as a child, you don't know if you, if you live in a, if you live as a pauper, you live in a palace, it's the same, right? You, you don't know any different. You're not trained any different. You don't have any insight to anything different. But it's only when you grow up and you think to yourself, wow, you know, like how difficult, especially when you have your own children, then that's just a, a whole different perspective on life and a whole different taste on life. And then you, th you feel like, yeah, you know what? We, we had it good, man. And then going back to Pakistan was a moment when, I mean, I didn't go back to Pakistan. My mom hasn't been back for a, for a long time because you just get busy in, in life, right? But, you know, going back to Pakistan into my ancestral home and... When was that? What <coughs> year was that? After how many years? So that was probably my late teens. Uh, so again, mum saved up very, you know, in very, very difficult times to to make sure that I could go back and see my, my father's family and my ancestral home in Pakistan. Uh, and I went back and I just, I loved, I loved Pakistan. I loved it. You know, it was like, it was like Indiana Jones, you know, your snakes, Scorpios, buffaloes. It was just like, wow, like, it's like wildness. And, you know, it was just like, it's like a jungle. It's, you, you, you feel that freedom, you know. <laughs> so we, we just came back from Bangladesh and my son is like six now. Okay. And he woke up crying this morning because we, we literally got off the plane last night. And he cr uh, woke up this morning and said, I want to go back to Bangladesh. And he's only six. And I was like, wow. Like, you know, he, he I, I guess he felt that independence. Yeah, you do. You do. And it's a... Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of love in, in those countries as well from your family. It's from the weather as well. Yeah. It's like it just it's so loving. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. You, you don't want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the uh, yeah. I guess that's that's the. So, so after how long did you did you I guess go into business at the age of seventeen? So you went to Pakistan and then you came back and then, how many years did you have in between before you started your first business and and how did that go about? So. I so I guess for me, seeing my mum in business and kind of like seeing her work. So hard she she had a shop. She ha yeah, she had a a market stall and then she had a retail shop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. From nothing. Amazing. She learned how to drive. So you know, like being in the shadows and hustling and going to warehouses and going to you know so and so place and buying cloth and so you know. Do you know what I mean? It was just it was just something that you seen and something that you learn. So I, I, it was just natural, like doing things and making things happen and being driven was just like what we seen. Um, and then I was a bit of a natural hustler at university as well, college, university. If you could buy a little bit here and you could sell it and you could buy this and you could sell it and you could do a deal, you do it, right? Because that's what you do, that's what you see. And so everybody, uh, I remember once at university, um, we had a final year show and a really good friend of mine, Steve, he said to me, I'm not going to show you what I'm doing. And I was like, why not? I'm, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm showcasing. 
So I'm not going to show you what I'm doing because if I show you what I'm doing, you're probably going <laughs> to end up <laughs> making a business out of it. <laughs> and I, I took it as a bit of a joke, but later on I thought to myself, actually, you know what, if it works and it sells, then you've got to just do it, right? And I guess that's what, alhamdulillah, if there's a gift that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you many, many blessings, but if there's a, like a natural gift, it is just a gift of being able to, to think of something, to have an idea, but then to make the idea work, to get it over the line. Um, so when I was at college, I... So I, did, did Steve eventually tell you like what he was doing? <laughs> I don't think he did. I think it, was, it wasn't a great idea anyway. <laughs> when, I, when I seen it, I was like, Steve, what is this, man? It's like, it's, <laughs> that's never going to work. <laughs> um, but I had my own design. Uh, so we, so at, un, at college, I had a part-time job. And the part-time job was working at a pizza shop. So it was kind of guaranteed income, 15 pounds a night. Uh, and it was a long night. And it was uh, above the pizza shop where I set up, set up Go Web Print. So Go Web Print is a, was a design agency to design web and print services, um, and that's where the life hustling life started. You know, you 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 you, you, you see somebody they want a they want a website back in the day. Now it's apps. So it was like okay, like we can develop an app. We can develop so, a website. So so did was it because you saw a opportunity, a gap, <coughs> or is is something that you kind of got exposed to? I mean, why go with print? So alhamdulillah, when I was at university, sorry, when I was at college at Wakefield College, um, we had a work experience. So work experience for our class was different. You know, somebody had a work experience at a, another print shop. Somebody had a work experience at a bakery. Somebody had a work experience at a legal firm. Uh, and my work experience was at Yorkshire Television. Nice. So, because uh, my tutors, they thought, you know, he's got, a, and it was the best work experience. So Tony and Ron, my tutors there at college, they believed in me. They they said, look, we know there's something there. There's, you've got something and we want you to go to Yorkshire Television and we want you to have this work experience and, and, and be exposed to that, to, to that because we know you could probably achieve something in that, in that, in that area. So I went there and I and I spent two weeks and I used to be the first one there. I used to hoover up, I used to make them tea. Mum bless, I used to make samosas, so I used to take samosas in. You know, like the, <laughs> that was like a little cheat, little <laughs> cheat to kind of get you. <laughs> that was a little cheat to get everybody's attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, one day one of the directors said, oh my God, I'm so busy, I, I need to get um, some Leeds United tickets for my, <clears throat> for my daughter. Uh, but I haven't got the time. And I said, that's fine. I said, I'll go get the Leeds United tickets for you. And then the Hoover broke down. And uh, I said, no problem, I'll go get the Hoover. So when my two, two weeks work experience finished, they were like, you're the, you're the best work experience person we've ever had on. And I was like, really, why? It's like, oh, yeah, you, 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 you clean up, you, you wash the dishes, you make the tea, you Hoover, you buy the Hoover. <laughs> if we need something, you go on like it's like a, you know, you go and buy the, this ticket and you've done this and you've done this and you're not afraid of hard work. And I was like, that's not hard work. It's, it's nice and warm in here. <laughs> it's a clean office. You want to see the market job that I've got. You know, you want to see the pizza shop, that office, that, uh, the job that I've got. So they extended that two-week work experience to six months. So once a week for six months. And uh, I learned so much there. I learned so much. And, you know, like you learn that it's normal human beings that are driving studios that are driving tv campaigns that are driving marketing campaigns we were buying or i was sat with teams that were buying multi-million pounds worth of advertising space and it was it was john little john who was making a few phone calls making a deal and you know he was buying advertising space for fisherman's friend or morrison's or dfs sofas and it was brilliant it was absolutely brilliant and it was like mind-blowing and i thought to myself after that six months I thought, you know, I can do this. You know, it's just a couple of calls to some agents and do this. And I can, you know, book in a, a print job and book in a web design job. I know some designers. So that whole thing came together in my mind. And it, in my mind, it was working. I could I could see it working. And so at the pizza shop where I was working, I says to the uh, the chap who owned it, I says, you've got massive double-fronted pizza shop. I said, all the room upstairs you're not doing anything with. You've got a few boxes. You've got a few bits of packaging here put those into a small room and I can take over the, the, the big room and I can make it into a, an office space and that's where Go Web Print started. So what did he say when you said like, okay, this is what I'm <coughs> going to do and, you know, obviously you're working at the pizza shop and now you're telling almost your employer yeah. that you've got a business idea and you want to rent his space. What was yeah. his reaction? His reaction was, you're a hard worker, I'll buy you a shop, we'll go 
and start making some money. I don't know what this go where print business is about, but you're not going to make any money doing this. And it sounds like a really, sounds like a really like ambitious idea and it's never going to work. So uh, you're just wasting your time. And he was right for the first few months. He, you know, we used to get bank statements coming in and, and the bank statements used to be like zero, zero. <laughs> <in the bank. laughs> and he opened, he opened the bank statement once and he said, uh, sorry, I opened your bank statement, but there's nothing in there. <laughs> your bank account is empty. He says, I told you I'll buy you a pizza shop and we'll go 50-50. And I says, it sounds like a great idea, but I just don't want to smell like a pizza kitchen for the rest <laughs> of my life. But he was like, no, no, you buy, by the time we finish, in five years' time, you'll have five buy-to-let houses, you'll have two taxis, and I was like, wow. I was like, that's just not, it's not, just that's not my just dream. That's just not me. That's just not my dream. But it's, it's good. You, you, you carry on, but I just don't want to do that. Uh, and I guess that, you know, I remember the first year I was in business, the first year for the whole year, we made £12,000 gross, £12,000. And my accountant said to me, Adimi, I know you're working hard. You work, you work day and night, uh, but you might want to choose a different career. And I says, no, 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 we're nearly there. <laughs> we're, we're nearly there. We can do it. We can do it. And that was on the when we were, you know, I was full-time college, was working the pizza shop, and then we had this business on the side that was just on the cusp of making something. Uh, and as I was working so hard in the pizza shop and as I was working so hard in the, uh, in the design agency, and I was looking, picking my brain to how to drive this thing, how to you know, scale this thing up and how to find new customers. Uh, as I was going home, my mum was uh, saying to me, right, okay, son, you're, you're at an age now where you're finishing college, you're going to university and you need to you need to get married now. So my mum was putting photographs of my first, co- first cousin on the mantelpiece and saying to me, look, beautiful girl, she's, uh, she's good at, you know, cooking, cleaning, she'll look after you and she'll give me some company at home as well. And I think you should. You sh- I think you should marry her. Right before before we get to that part, <laughs> I want to I want to cover. Um, I want to ask you about your restaurant business. <laughs> so you went from Go Web Print. I mean, what happened to Great Go Web Print um, eventually? So Go Web Print, um, it's still kind of there. It's still kind of there. It's still there. Yeah, 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 yeah. We still do a little bit of uh, buying and selling print. As you know, paper is a commodity, so. You know, you can you can still do some deals here and there. Okay. But it's not it's not a main focus. Okay. Um, so restaurant, how did that come about? So one of my uncles, my dad, uh, my mum's uh, younger brother, uh, Uncle Ashraf, may Allah have mercy on his soul, he's no longer with us. He uh, one of his biggest regrets when he was younger, and he used to tell me, he used to say, my biggest regret is two things. Number one is not traveling enough. And number two is he had an opportunity to be a partner in a restaurant. And the restaurant did really, really well. And he says, look, I, I blew the opportunity. And so then I thought, okay, that's, a, you know, traveling, I get it. If you've got time, it's a, it's a luxury, isn't yeah, it? You know? yeah. um, but when an opportunity came at a local restaurant and they was looking for partners and I heard that, I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a go. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And it was the first restaurant of its kind. We had a just eat system where we'd get orders online. And every time we'd get an order, there'd be a, a speaker in the counter and it'd go off and it'd make an alarm sounding noise. So you'd have to go and access the order, process the order, and then the the, the, the alarm would go off. And it was it was it it went really well. Uh, it was the first time that a, an Indian restaurant I'd known, uh, what we developed was there was no flock wallpaper and there was no elephants. It was a very modern, contemporary style Indian restaurant and we called it Flavor FL. A V A, and what we were doing is we were looking at other ways to make it attractive. So as we were looking to design some dishes and make some, we had a we had a watermelon dish where we'd carved out the the watermelon and then we'd served the curry in the watermelon itself. Uh, and then we thought to ourselves, okay, what what other dishes? And we were just just so happened that there was a chocolate. We were eating a chocolate. And we thought, okay, why don't we put the chocolate in the curry <laughs> and make it into a chocolate curry? And so that's where the chocolate curry came about. How did it taste? As a side dish, it was nice. But, you know, chocolate isn't a, a curry. It's just too filling. It was too rich. So as a small side dish, beautiful. And then we 
Can you imagine? Who made that dish? I mean, was there a chef? We had a chef. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. what did the chef say? Like, what, the what chef is this? Says, you, 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 you're bugger. He says, you're stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're, you guys are just losing the plot. I says, no, no, look, it's... It, I, and actually, when we did some research, it, it turned out to be an old Mexican ingredient. Okay. So the Mexicans cook curries with chocolate. Uh, so we are next door to Bradford. So Wakefield is next door to Bradford. And Bradford has to be the curry capital of the UK, probably even Europe. Um, and when we launched the chocolate curry, we had tabloid newspapers from up and down the country coming and doing interviews and getting us on TV, getting us onto radio, like you know, just press. Uh, did you did you reach out to phenomenal. Yorkshire? What, what was it? Yorkshire Yorkshire Times. Was Yorkshire, it? Yorkshire TV. Yorkshire TV. Did yeah, you yeah, tell them about everybody your? Everybody covered it. Everybody covered it at that time. It was phenomenal. And then I remember Valentine's. We did a special Valentine's uh, dish with the chocolate curry being at the heart of it. Our menu, and it we had. A queue out the door. Literally, we had a queue. We could not serve the dish. There wasn't enough, yeah, time of day. We had booking on a booking on a booking. It was just, it was just mental, absolutely mental. So, obviously, mashallah, you're very successful. You've, you, you. It seems that it seems like you're very decisive when you want something, and when you don't want something. It also seems that you're quite, you're very innovative. Even back in two thousands, <laughs> you know, you, you, you had to have your kind of edge or angle when you meet someone well how do you describe yourself who are you who's who the, who's adam Yunus? when i meet somebody yeah i, I just say I, I, i'm a graphic designer really yeah even now even now somebody says to me what do you what do you do i say i'm a graphic designer i'm just a, I'm just a graphic designer I, i'm a designer at heart wow <laughs> is, is is that is that what you really are is that what you study i'm passionate about marketing i'm passionate about uh, the psychology behind marketing, by behind purchasing, behind and, you know, I, look, I find people interesting. I fi find people very, very interesting. Why people make certain decisions, why people don't make certain decisions, how you can influence decisions, how you can, you know, design and get people to purchase certain things and 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 influence their decision making. But also, what triggers people off, because there's certain triggers that you know we're we're bu built with and we're born with, uh, and that we're conditioned to do and then how do you influence those in terms of what we're where we want to go in life but i think so faith, faith, graphic designer faith sorry faith is the biggest thing that kind of positions me and what 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 i want to do and where i want to where i want to be amazing so adam Yunus, the graphic designer <laughs> um now talk to me about i guess single muslim year 2000 so what yeah. happened? How did it happen? I know it's something to do with marriage, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, when I was doing the marketing, when I had my marketing agency, and I was pushing that hard, uh, as I was saying, my mom was pushing me hard to get married. So I was trying to... Why? Get, Why was she kind of pushing you so hard to get... I mean, you were quite young. Yeah, 18, 19, yeah, 20. But I guess that's the age, right? That's the age where parents see you as a young man young young lady and they say all right okay can start considering where you're gonna go where yeah. your next moves are because you're naturally gonna go through academia you're gonna go to school college university it's just a natural progress isn't it and then you're gonna get work you're gonna that's that's gonna happen but you need to stand on your own two feet you need to take responsibility yeah. as our parents <coughs> say uh, and then yeah just where find somebody and i'm like Mom, I can't find somebody because all my life you've been saying to me like having a girlfriend is haram. <laughs> you're gonna <laughs> go to you're gonna go to hell if you have a girlfriend. Don't have a girlfriend. It's gonna bring disrespect onto the family. Look, kya kahenge? What will people say that he's got a girlfriend and you know he's he's out hanging about with wrong type of people, wrong society? So don't be don't be kind of like you know put him in that position. So you stay away from girls and not because you're not attracted to them, but because you know, you're going to get a good beating at home, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, at that age, nine, 18, 19, mum's like, okay, have you got somebody that you'd like to get married to? And I'm like, what kind of crazy question is that? Like, you've been telling me to, to stay away from girls, and now you're saying to me, have you got somebody? No, I haven't. Well, if you haven't got anybody, we're going back to Pakistan, and we're going to get you married to your uncle's daughter. I was like, what? I'm going back to Pakistan? I was like, I love Pakistan, and I've obviously mum saved up and, you know, took us to Pakistan. And, I, you know, I think the place is wonderful, but I, when when people say it's worlds apart, I don't see P Pakistan being a world apart. I see 
Pakistan has been a universe apart. You know, the culture, the education, the lifestyle, the mentality, the what what people are, what they want for their future, um, everything, everything is just so different. So I couldn't think of anything worse than to get married to somebody from Pakistan who's my first cousin because I just don't have any, for, not for any other reason, but I just don't have anything in common with them. And, you know, like, because I guess being born and brought up in the UK having a Western mentality, you want to fall in love, you want to be with somebody who, you know, you have hopes and dreams and aspirations and like-minded and you want to grow all together. So it's something that just wasn't, I just couldn't comprehend. So then I thought, okay, let's put my, uh, and it does sound desperate, but, you know, um, necessity is mother of all action. <laughs> I thought, you know, why don't why don't I design a website to uh, buy myself a wife? And that's <laughs> that's when that that's when that happened. And it is desperate. And I guess, you know, it's called probably the the most desperate thing that <laughs> anybody has ever done. But desperate but innovative as well. Yeah, because you need to, don't you? There's a ne- there's a necessity there, and there's not there was nothing there. We were pioneers in the market. You know, we were the first to do that. So who who developed it? Sorry, um, I cut you off. Who, who developed the so website? There was a small team of us and uh, we, so the design agency, there was a designer, tech guy, and it was easy, it was an easy development, but because back in the day, remember the dial up, do, 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 yeah, I yeah. think the youngsters won't remember that, but those of us that remember the desktop, it, it was literally a form. And so you fill in a form and then you match yourself to somebody with a form. So if your likes and their likes match, then you you know you could search, you can search on location, you can search on ec- uh, education, you can search on income, you can search on religiosity. So how religious you are? Do you pray regular? Do you not pray? Have you been on Hajj? Have you been on Umrah? That, that do you keep halal? That kind of thing, and it and it worked. It really it became a pretty it much must a have success. been quite a, quite a bit of research. I mean, with with data and you know kind of kind of organizing that data. No, not it, really. No, not really. Not, not, no, because remember back then, this wasn't a thing. Data wasn't a thing. Online digital wasn't a thing. Websites weren't a thing. We were the first of a, of, I mean, like now it does, it like what? Data isn't a thing. Websites, are, there was nothing. People didn't know what that. So you effectively that, created that data. We created that market space. We create that marketplace. Um, <coughs> and we started to build a database and we have got the largest Muslim database in the UK without a shadow of a doubt because we've been going now this year, we've been going 25 years. Wow, so 25 years. Alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah. So, did you find your wife then? Alhamdulillah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Five, five years after the official launch of the business. It took that long. <laughs> and I... I I kind of I stole my mum. I says, "Look, mum, I'm finding somebody. I'm gonna, I wanna, you know, I'm getting there. I'm meeting somebody. I'm meeting people." Uh, and I guess at the at the st- at the start, and it takes me back now when I, when we when we help people today about what it is that you're looking for, because as a young man, 18, 19 years old, starting my search, you know, you need to find a, you, need, you know, it's it's half of our thing to find a wife, right, to get married. But who am I looking for? I'm looking for a I'm looking for a young lady. I'm looking for a, a woman. I'm looking for the mother of my children. But I don't know who that is. I genuinely don't know who that is. I've been conditioned by movies, by books, by modern society, by Walt Disney, I guess, watching movies about who that person would be. But in reality, who is that person? So meeting somebody, kind of like, okay, I don't. I like this, I don't like this, I think this could be difficult to manage, I think this would be really nice. So you kind of, after meeting somebody, you kind of like almost evolve who you want to find and yeah, Alhamdulillah went there. Hey guys, I hope you have been enjoying today's episode with Adim Yunus, the founder of Single Muslim. If you have been enjoying, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, like, comment and share this episode. Now let's get straight back into the show. What was the reaction in your community about single Muslim? I mean, back then, it was kind of a manual process, wasn't it? You know, like you said, you know, yeah, sharing yeah. Photograph, photographs, CVs, biodatas. How did they receive it, the, the, the elderly or the community? Yeah, no, good question. Good question. Back then, at that time, and it is a long time ago, 
photographs used to be haram. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Photographs were haram. You only had one photograph and that's for your passport. You're not allowed any of the photographs. You're not allowed to listen to music. You're not allowed to ha- watch anything. YouTube or anything like that. Video is haram. It's all haram. So having a website and having photographs and having profiles on a platform, the website was seen as evil. I mean, let's just be frank about it because there was only one thing at that time that online was being used for and that was porn and that people knew that and it was like no that's haram that whole thing is haram <laughs> don't, don't even go there and it must be evil and you know the kind of people that use that uh, so they wrote it off before you even kind of got to explaining what the what the website was about i don't th- no i think people people who knew and people who used online knew that you know there was benefits there and what it, what the potentials were but just the common joe didn't know what the uh, website was i guess or what a website could be used for and and i and i tell this story because one of my aunties a community auntie she called me to her house and and, and i went to the house and she sat me down and she literally like literally told me off and she says you know stop meddling with our traditions you're not even married yourself and how dare you set up this you know f- machine because my <laughs> uncle used to work at the mill <laughs> so she's thinking all this like she doesn't even know what the, on uh, a website is or a, she's like why why have you set this machine up <laughs> to help people get married this is not what we do this is not our tradition and literally just give me such a telling off that close to i guess beating me up but yeah just like told me to get out of the house <laughs> um and about two months later two three months later she called me back to the house i was like oh my god like last time auntie like, literally verbally abused me this this time it might get physical this time i might not come out alive <laughs> Anyway, knocked on the door. She's like, oh, better come in, sit down. Uh, how, old you, how old are you now? Uh, what are you doing? Are you at college? Okay, you're at college. What are you studying at college? Would you like a drink, cold drink, tea, coffee, biscuits, bring some fruit in? Thinking it's a VIP treatment. What's going on here? And she says, well, you know, uh, my son, uh, Jamil, he's trying to get married. And I was like, oh, okay. She says, well, we're looking for a wife for Jamil. And Jamil, obviously in, in, uh, in Urdu, we can't find anybody for Jamil, so I was wondering if you can help me <laughs> find somebody <laughs> for Jamil. I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll find somebody for Jamil. He goes, how does it work? Maybe call Jamil in, sit down with Jamil, tell Jamil how it works, help Jamil, and let's uh, let's get Jamil married off. I was like, yeah, no problem, because it's a need, isn't it? Again, yeah, it's a human need. So if it's a misunderstanding, it's misunderstanding. But when a human then needs that service, when a human wants to get to a place, and that is the only thing left. Then we got we got Jamil on there. We found we found Jamil somebody, and Jamil's now happily married uh, with still four, married. Ch- four children. Still married, mashallah. Uh, and uh, Auntie, yeah, still still thanks me when I sit with her, and she's like, remember that time when I we have we have a laugh about it. But again, it's 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 the unknown, isn't it? And I guess that's that's the problem with the world today. All the problems that we're facing, small or big, in the entire world, is because. We don't know what we don't know, and we are, you know, we're we're scared of the unknown. So, how long did it take for you to reach your first thousand or so membership? So the first, I mean, for me, the the website was kind of a surprisingly immediate success because as soon as we went live, I mean, we, there was no SEO, there was no search engine, engine optimization, there was no indexing, there was no marketing. It was kind of unheard of, but we launched this website. So as soon as we launched it, we were like, okay, well, yeah, that was nice. Let's go. Let's go do some proper work now. Within like five minutes, our first user was called, I don't know why they called themselves Pepsi Cola, but the first user was called Pepsi Cola. And it was like, wow, somebody's somebody's seen us, somebody's registered and fully registered. And then within a within a few days, people were going through the registration process and paying. So the guys in the team were like, Adeem, you can't charge people money because nobody's going to pay. I says, how do you know somebody's not going to pay if you've not even asked them to pay? If you ask them to pay, what's going to happen? Most likely they will pay. Somebody will pay <laughs> because they want to use it. Yeah. So people start paying and it was like, wow, oh my God, people are paying. So people, because we're a, a website, it's 24-7, right? There's no closing or opening times. We had people paying us during the day, we had people paying us during the night, we had people paying us over the weekend, we had people paying on bank holidays, we had money was just coming in, it was just like, what is going on here? I had an alarm on my phone, and every time a, a payment email would come, it, w- 
with alarm. It was like, boom, and I had to turn it off. Because <laughs> initially it was like, it was kind of like, oh, that's, yeah, when we get a, you know, when we get a payment, it'd be that nice. It's like, oh, okay, we got an email, payment email. I had to turn the thing off because it was just so, it was just buzzing. It was just constant. Wow. So Alhamdulillah, the, you know, within the first six months a year, it started rolling and it started, but we were early adopters. We were really, really early adopters. And I think if truth be told, we were, we were a little bit too early into the marketplace, but that allowed us to kind of really bed in and cement, yeah, work the bugs out, work the systems out, work the processes out. Um, and start building up some marketing revenue and some reserves that, you know, we're able to then, because we're a, you know, what we call a, a bootstrap business. It's it's totally self-funded. So there's no bank of dad. There's no loans. We're a debt-free business. I mean, you know that. You still are. We still are. We still are a debt-free business. Amazing. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, we've never, yeah, we've never, you've, you, you know, you want to take debt out, but you just, that's not our ethics. Yeah. It's not. It's not the ethics of our company and business to, to do that. Um, and yeah, we've never we've never done that. So yeah, alhamdulillah. So obviously, it was it was a success, um, and I'm sure it still is. So what happened between uh, I guess 2000 and 2000, 2024? I mean, we've seen a hike of competitors or competing websites. I mean. What, at what point did you see that kind of hockey stick hike of competitors kind of copying every, single Muslim? Every week, every month. We have, we have new competitors in the marketplace all the time, all the time. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. Um, but you know what? Because single Muslim had a, a design agency that was kind of like, you know, uh, allowing us to bring some income in. Single Muslim, again, is, is a project which I guess was a personal project for for personal reasons, but also it was, and I remember the story when um, I, uh, I met my then wife and I came back to the office and one of the, another one of our developers called Steve and he says, he says to me, Adeem, uh, how, how, uh, how was the day? I says, I think she's the one, I think she's the one. He says, okay, boss, should we close the website down? <laughs> <laughs> job done. <laughs> job done, job done. I says, no, please don't close the website down, man. This is uh, it's, it's good for, it's good for business. But it was, it's a community project because, look, if our community was doing its job right, if our mosques, if our community centers, if our elders would have the network and had the, the foresight to work together, as, as I guess in an ideal world everybody would do, there'd be, no re- there'd be no room for single Muslim, right? Because single Muslim would be like, you don't need it. You know, everything's working fine. But single Muslim took the place of the masajid of the community center, of the family members. And we actually became, a, we actually became a process or a step, you know, for mosques to use the service, for uncles and aunties to use the service, for mother and fa- mothers and fathers to use the platform to find matches for their children. You know, siblings are registering on behalf of their brothers or sisters uh, and, and using it as a platform to, to help them find people. Well, and and um, I don't know if you are going to share share the response or answer that question. At your peak, what was the best revenue? I'm not going to share that answer. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, but, alhamd- but alhamdulillah, it, the revenue allowed us to be very, very comfortable, allowed us to, to do better than our, you know, our, our, our fathers and our grandpa- gra- grandparents and, and, and be comfortable for And you've generation. made your mother happy, right? You know, you've kind of taken away all the burdens that you kind of witnessed alhamdulillah, her raising alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. you guys. So, alhamdulillah. mashallah. And you're still a, sh- a single shareholder. Yes. Single Muslim, single shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so, how did people like Muz, you know, come and kind of, join the motorway that you're kind of driving on and they kind of became a very big player in the market. I mean, what happened? Why is it that you guys are not in the, I guess, in your own position, but at the same time, ahead of Muz in the app game? Because remember, look, we, we were not born in the, we were not born in the last decade. We were, we were born two and a half decades ago. So, you know, we were desktop and now we are app. Uh, we're kind of multi-platform. And, um, you know, these things happen, people, people come in. And also, 
when we when we started, we kind of pioneered the space. We set up the market, uh, the, the the space, um, and the market share has grown massively. So there's there's market there for older Muslims. There's market there for middle aged Muslims, and there's market there for younger Muslims. There's there's loads of niches. So in at the beginning, there's only one niche, which is Muslims. And now there's Muslim professionals, there's young Muslims, there's established Muslims, there's this, that, the other. So Alhamdulillah, there's it's a it's a big enough playing field for 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 more. So than what's your part. niche? I mean, what single Muslims niche? Our niche are, are, is an authentic platform to help people get married. An authentic platform that's been there and that's established. That's established by Muslims for Muslims. A safe place where you know we've had our own family members on there we've had our own you know brothers sisters on there finding people um so yeah alhamdulillah it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a place that, that has got a proven track record how do you guys authenticate do you ever get to see other people's messages you know that's the other thing that we have teams of people here in the uk we don't have any teams in bangladesh in pakistan in india you know nowhere so our team is based in Wakefield, West Yorkshire. And when I say team, I was, I'm saying our tech team, our marketing team, our design team, and our verification team. So all our profiles are hand verified. And when I'm saying hand verified, every single photograph is verified by hand. All your profile information is verified by hand. We have a telephone number as well, which not a lot of online companies, as you, as you know, not none of the main companies have because they want to, streamline and scale up but we have a telephone support line as well um so you know quality for us is really is really kind of at the forefront of what we're doing and it's always been there we're a, we're a company that's that's authentic to our roots and and they're really we're a you know we're, we're we're a people first business and we want to make that that process to you finding somebody kind of easy and you, we want you to be thinking that you're in a safe place you know so is it AI or is it code is that kind of flag up certain type of conversations and, and how do you kind of monitor the, the conversation that are maybe inappropriate? Do we, you guys monitor it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have AI that's monitored that, and we have flags and we have filters and we have a reporting mechanism that other members can report. We have uh, a team of people who just sit there every single day of the week um, and listen to customer feedback, and then we investigate. We have a full investigation system as well in terms of going back and looking through profiles, looking through messages. Um, and we have, you know, we we have a zero tolerance policy as well. We've always, for 25 years, we've had a zero tolerance policy. So if we feel that somebody's not there for the right reasons, they are initially blocked straight away, and then they go through a whole critical investigation process and if we feel they're not right then they're blacklisted their emails are blacklisted the ips are blacklisted the images are blacklisted so if somebody joins with a similar kind of image they they immediately immediately resolved immediately removed and that for us is the safety of our our platform basically a healthy platform is a successful platform and that's what we've always had okay to. is it generally men or women that kind of you know, <laughs> mess around <laughs> on the platform. Like, you know, what's the percentage? You know what? And it has changed. It has changed massively. You would not believe it. Um, initially, it was it was pretty much felt like it was all men. And now it's pretty much 50-50. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know what? I think a lot of females, they I think they wouldn't class it as... But what happens is that if they're seeing somebody... Say so, for example, if you were if you were on the platform, you messaged a female, and then she thought that you were not messaging her enough, or you're not messaging her at the right time. She might create another profile to message you to see if you messaged another profile. Wow, that is that is madness at do, do this you know, stage. Do, do you know what, do you know what I mean? So it's like they're trying to create multiple profiles to catch you out to see Damn. if you're talking to other people. Damn. And it's like, it, so there's nothing as what we say in Yorkshire, there's, you know, there's nothing as queer as folk. Like you, we, you couldn't imagine things that people do to catch other people out. And she's not doing it for a 
bad reason. She's doing it through almost like securing herself or wanting the validation that she's talking to somebody who's genuine. And then when you, when our teams have done an investigation saying like, okay, so you've reported him, but when we've looked into the report and we've looked into the profiles that are contacting him, why do you have three profiles that are contacting him? Oh, well, I, I couldn't log in, so I set up another profile. And I, I don't know. No, but you're, you're messaging from that profile and you're messaging from that profile and you're messaging from that profile. Oh, yeah, because why is he talking to another profile? And it's like, wow. Oh, yeah, it's like... That is crazy. It's like, wow. So there's nothing... In the 25 years that we've had set up, there's not a lot of things that our teams have not seen and endured and experienced. I had a, a few years ago, it was really bizarre. So I was in the office, uh, the teams answered the call and there was a woman on the call and she said, why do you have fake success stories on your website? And uh, the, the, one, the, uh, the lady on the phone on this side she was like, no, all our success stories are not fake. They're all genuine. Like, no, 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 your success stories are fake. So-and-so, so-and-so is not married anymore. That's a fake uh, That's a fake success story. So they're, they're, po- they're looking at me and they're pointing at me and they're like, fake, they're, somebody's reporting that's a fake success story. I said, it's not a fake success story. I was at, I, I was at their wedding. So I'm like, no, it wasn't like, talk to me, it's okay. And... Uh, so the, the lady on this side is getting really frustrated now because she's just getting attacked. It's it's fake. You like you guys are lying. You guys are doing this. And I could see that she's getting frustrated. So I said, pass the, pass the call over to me. So I took the call and I said, sister, how can I help? She says, so-and-so on your website. They're not married. I says, yes, they are. They're married. I went to their um, wedding. They've got a son. Their son's name is this. The girl started crying. The girl who was reporting to us that their story was fake started crying. I said, sister, can you just tell me what the truth is? Why are you calling in? What's the matter? She says, they're no longer married and I and he's back on your website and I've met him now and I want to get married to him. But if that success story remains on the website and my family sees that he was previously married and he's got a success story on the website, my family are not going to let me get married to him. So I says, okay, so what the reality is that he's divorced now and he's gone back onto the website. You're on the on, on the website and you want to marry him. She says, yes, that's that's right. So I says, you'd like me to remove that story? She says, yes, please. Is that, is that it? Job so, done. So, <laughs> job done, we remove the... But do you know what I mean? It's like, it gets so it gets so complicated with, with humans, especially, look, we're in the business of dealing with dealing with feelings and emotions yeah and when you're dealing with dealing with feelings and emotions and matters of the heart it's very very difficult must be very, quite very, charged very, up very, very ch- charged up every single day of the week <laughs> <laughs> you know what i never thought of it like this you are i mean it is like deep hard emotions that is mad I mean, maybe not a business that I'd like to be involved <laughs> in. <laughs> amount of kind of, um, I guess, calls we'd be getting. Now, obviously, you started Penny Appeal as well, which some people think to be a success, some people think not to be. You guys have generated zero to hundred million in ten years. I mean, what's the? I mean, what was the reason behind Penny Appeal, and how did you kind of take it to that hundred million? So Alhamdulillah, you know, it, it has been a huge, huge success, but at the same time, it's been a huge learning experience. What do you call it? A hockey stick, yeah? Yeah. The, 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 I, like, I like that. I used to love playing hockey at school. Um, the, the, the story of Penny Peel really, you know, came about. It's uh, Penny Peel was set up in, uh, in, in the me- memory of my late father, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Um, and uh, it was something that inspired me because of me going back to Pakistan when I was a child and uh, just thanking Allah for the ability to be born in this country, to be born in this country, to have an education, to have clothes, to have a roof over my head, to have, a, you know, to, to be able to, to, to give back. Uh, and, you know, having single Muslim, having a business that's a dot-com success, alhamdulillah, you know, allowed me to save decades of my life and to get to where 
you would get normally at retirement age. You know, I got to the the assets and I got to the income of, you know, being a in that group of people early early day early days of my life. And that, then you think to yourself, you ask yourself the question: Is like, what is life all about? Like, literally, what is life all about? Why are we doing this? Why are we here? And uh, my father passed away when I was, like I was saying, he passed away when I was young. And I thought to myself, I'm going to pass away also when I'm younger. Like, what guarantee have I got of life? So when we when we were working on single Muslim and I was going back to Pakistan, I went back to my ancestral home in Pakistan. And my chacha, my dad's brother, showed me this 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 home. And he said, this this home is your home. This is the home that your father built before he went to the UK. And I looked at it and it was like, it was literally a mud hut. There was, there was like boulders there. There was like, you know, like mud keeping it together. There was hay. And it was like, it looked really pretty. But I thought to myself, wow, that's, is that it? I thought to myself, my double garage at home has got better foundation, has got better electrics, has got better insulation, has got a better roof. And that's, that's my double garage. That's what I use as a bit of a storeroom. And this is, this is, this is my family home in Pakistan. Uh, and I was like, Alhamdulillah, you know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, like, thank, all, all praises to Allah, like genuinely, like, this is what I could have, this is what could have been me. So we spot, we start supporting people, you know, in terms of uh, helping people with fertilizer, if they're, if they had a bad crop, helping people with debt, helping people with water, helping people with feeding. But one of my best projects was uh, an education, pro, uh, you know, like a program that we had. So we were helping young children get into school. And one of the teachers that we were supporting was uh, a teacher called Ali. And Ali was getting paid 30 pounds a month. So with 30 pounds a month, Ali was supporting himself. Ali was supporting his, his children. Ali was supporting his uh, wife. And Ali was supporting his parents as well. And Ali was the happiest person that you'll ever meet in your life. He had a little bicycle. And he was, you know, riding around in the village and he'd come and he'd see me when, he, when, he, when he'd go away, he'd do like a little moonwalk. You know, like, out of respect, don't mm. want to turn my back to you. I want to do, and and, mm. he'd, and he'd be thanking me and I was like, no, Ali, thank you, man. You know, like, Jazakallah Hair, thank you for educating this generation because there's only one way of truly getting people out of poverty. You can feed people, you can clothe people, but you have to give them the different mindset for them to be able to pull themselves out of poverty. So remember, thirty pound a month is what Ali was getting paid to to do that job, and I was only in Pakistan for long weekends. So I'd fly over Thursday evening, get there Friday morning, stay Friday, Saturday, fly back Sunday, because we've got you know a lot of work and a lot of things happening here in the UK. So when I came back to the UK, uh, my car was parked at Manchester Airport. I picked my car up, and there was no fuel in it, so I went to the petrol station, just in the in the in the in the airport itself, and I started filling up. And I was as I was filling up. In my mind, I was still thinking about Ali. I was thinking about Ali's parents. I was thinking about the hospitality. I was thinking, these people are the poorest people I've ever met in my life, but they're the most loving and the most generous people that I've ever, ever, ever met. And I was putting this, pe putting the petrol in, and it was going. Zzzz. I thought to myself, you know, like there's no point putting half a tank in. Just put the full tank in, take the pain, and then just drive off. And when the tank's empty, you fill it back up again. Anyway, it clicked. And when it clicked, I looked over. And I looked over and it was 90 pounds. So on a normal day, I wouldn't look. I wouldn't care. Just 90 pounds. Pay, move on. I thought to myself, 90 pounds, subhanAllah. 90 pounds, that's three months worth of salary for Ali. A quarter of a year. So I've just put in three months, quarter of a year of Ali's salary into my car. And I'm going to drive to Leeds. I'm going to drive to Bradford. I might go to Manchester. And that, that car's going to be empty and I'll fill it up again. Mobile phone contracts, gym memberships that we never use, you know, all sorts of things. And that's when, on that forecourt in Manchester Airport, I thought, right, okay, there's got to be something better than this. Like, why? There's only, I'm supporting one Ali in a rural village in Pakistan. There's millions of Ali's in Pakistan and there's hundreds of millions of Ali's all around the world. Like, there's got to, why can't we, why can't we do something to help these people? So that's when I kind of made a promise to myself to set up a charity. And I thought, you know what? It's going to be called Penny Appeal because it's not about thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds, millions of pounds. We can all do our little bit. If 
like we were supporting, so single Muslim was supporting Ali. I thought, okay, let's, you know, it was the charity Penny Peel was going to be called the Single Muslim Foundation. <laughs> and I thought, that's not a very, that's not a very attractive marketing <laughs> name. <laughs> you know, even the single Muslims are not going to be able to want to pay to that. So then, then it was just, yeah, it was just, it was just Penny Peel. It was like, yeah, small change. That's what it is. It's about the small change, making the big difference. Your 30 pounds, your pennies per day, transforming lives in rural villages, starting from education, orphan sponsorship, water, feeding and emergencies, and alhamdulillah. Um, so hmm, when, where did, I mean, obviously we've, we've all seen kind of on social media, news, you know, a lot of talks about penny appeal. I mean, why and how? I mean, how did it, I guess, in my mind, how did it go wrong? Because obviously you started with a very noble intention, yeah, with a yeah, very yeah, yeah. noble objective. But where did it all kind of... I think the biggest lesson for me out of this is that, you know, where it started going wrong is when we started it up. Starting something up that you have no idea about is the first wrong thing that you do, right? Because you started up an airliner. What did you know about the air airline industry? Nothing. You were learning on the job, right? You were learning about contracts. You were learning about aviation. You were learning about licenses. You were learning about restrictions. You were learning about, you know, the mafia. There's a, there's a mafia in every single business and there's a mafia in the charity sector as well. And my biggest heartache in my life came when I set up Penny Appeal thinking that there's going to be a utopian world of hallelujah, praise, praise be to Allah. And everybody's fighting each other. As soon as you set up a charity and as soon as you ask somebody for money, they're like, hmm, you want five pound off me? Where's that five pound going to go? How much is it going to go to the admin? How much is going to go here? How much is going to go here? Like, you know what? We're growing. Like, we're growing millions of pounds every single year. So our first year, we did 50,000 pounds. 50,000 pounds business in the first year. Second year, we did 300,000 pounds. Third year, we did 2.5 million. Fourth year, we did 8 million fifth year we did 12 million so we have got income coming in that like we don't have the systems to deal with and we don't have the people we don't have the manpower to really deal with it we've got money coming in because look at the end of the day alhamdulillah our intentions were and inshallah our intentions are still to help those that are most in need around the world and because of the way that we did it because of my digital background because of the the database, so literally single Muslim wrote Penny Peel a blank check. So everybody that we knew, all the people on our databases, they got messages about our work that we were doing with Penny Peel, our campaign that we were doing with Penny Peel. And it just kind of like, it just went crazy out of control. So in 10 years, don't forget that we've not just set up a, a charity that's raised 100 million, over 100 million. This is a global charity with offices around the world. Guinness World Record, award winning. You know, this is this is something that is has been such an amazing pleasure and a privilege to to be part of and to be part of so many individuals and so many different beautiful different journeys and beautiful different stories. And you've got to remember as as well is that my father isn't a sheikh or a politician. My father doesn't come from a you know the 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 brotherhood or you know, the Bligi Jamaat or so on and so forth. This was done from a group of, you know, British Muslims and non-Muslims who had an intention of doing good. So we shook the market. We were disruptors on a different scale and we were bold and we were brave and we were fast and we took every opportunity that we could take and we were loud and we were bright orange. <laughs> <laughs> so but your competitor, Muz, founder of Muz, Shazad Yunus, thinks otherwise. Um, he said um, in, a, in a podcast show that Penny Appeal m moved millions of pounds from charity to the, I guess, companies founded by the founders, i.e. yourself. That's absolutely incorrect. That's absolutely incorrect. There's, 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 no, there's no companies that are connected to Penny Peel that, that I own. And we 
this information has come from our audited accounts. So we are audited every single year. The charity is audited. And if you look at the audited accounts, the audited accounts have this information in. This information was misconstrued and this information was, it's basically misinformation and then sharing that out there for self-publicity. But why? Publicity. Why, why would someone want to do that? I mean, self, Self-publicity. What? Uh, so you're saying what they're, they're piggybacking on you to kind of We've put a spin in the market to get more? You got So the people that are doing this and one of the names that you've mentioned there, he's known for this. So if you, if you look at his previous copycat incidences where he's copied other platforms other other platforms that are very questionable and then what is he what has he done is used he's used that and you know here's a campaign where people are attacking me why are people attacking you because you're copying somebody you've gone to court you've lost court battles because of what you've done and what you've how you've behaved and so rather than saying sorry or rather than saying so he's he he does this and he's a tro- he, d- he trolls on social media he's he's he he's, he sells he says that himself. Uh, I troll on social media, so the best way to get publicity, and you know this as well. Any any businessman out there, anybody that, uh, that had marketing experience, he just you know shout the loudest and point fingers, and uh, you know cause this nuisance and this noise, and people will look at you and look at what you're doing. Um, and what a what a better way to get attention. So if if that obviously you're saying is misinformation, then why did you get suspended in two thousand and nineteen? I was never suspended. No. 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 As a trustee, I was. I've been a trustee. I was a founder of Penny Peel, and I've been a. I've been a trustee until this day. I, there were some allegations that were made against me, as I call with the, a rogue CEO, and it was a coup. I call it a coup that happened because you know what they say. Success has ma- success has many fathers, failure has none. So when you you when you're when you have something that's successful, when you have something that's you know doing really well, everybody that's in there, everybody that's involved in it, wants to say that that was me. Uh, and then we had a we had a rogue CEO who tried to do a coup, uh, made a lot of allegations, and I stepped aside to allow an independent process to to be conducted, and that was conducted and. He had to then step away and, and yeah. And then Is resume. it true though? I mean, there was a lot of allegations and, and I'm just kind of, I'm, I guess I've, I've never asked you those questions, although I had the opportunity to ask you like, Adim, is this true? Yeah. So you guys would um, send fancy packages to your donors and stuff like that. That kind of was produced by your own companies. Is that yeah. true? No, never. My businesses don't don't interact with the char with the charity. Are they There's your clients? My businesses don't no. They have never done that. Fancy packages is not fancy packages. Feedback brochures or products that we sell. Palest- Palestinian dates so that we just launched again. Uh, we sell Penny the Prayer Bear, and then we have a book that we've published as well called Small Change, Big Difference. So these are all feedback. These are all kind of products for a charity to do its charitable work uh, along in in line with its charitable objectives so your form <laughs> i'm sorry if i was, if i'm sounding kind of um, intrusive that's not my nature that's not how i am that's not who i am but i guess our research says your former employees say your organization penny appeal is one of the most immoral organization you will find has that changed so you again, you know this, and you are a nice guy. So, and I, I get the fact that, that you're gonna do the research. But if you've got disgruntled ex-employees, there's a lot of things that people say when they leave you. There's a lot of things that, you know, partners that you've got relationships with that you've been with and that you've been in love with over years and years, and you've had a beautiful life with. When you go your separate ways, people say things and people do things. And are you gonna believe those? Or are you gonna? You know, believe the work that we do and you're going to see the work that we do. Yes, we've had lots of challenges. I'll be the first to say that we've had lots of challenges. We've had challenges on every single every single front in terms of growth challenges. We've had uh, challenges in the kind of processes. We've had challenges in uh, um, our governance. But what we've done and how we've dealt with it is that we've acknowledged the challenge that we've had. We've seen those challenges and we've dealt with those challenges and we've grown from those challenges 
where we are today in 2024 is a very, very different organization than we were in 2009 when we set it up. And alhamdulillah, we had to go through those challenges. Is British Muslim TV part of the whole mix of, uh, I mean, is it part of Penny Appeal? Is it to kind of promote Penny Appeal? Or where does British Muslim TV sit? British Muslim TV is an independent third party business that Penny Appeal has used to grow itself. So Penny Appeal has grown with having contracts, broadcast contracts. Penny Appeal has grown having digital contracts. And those, those elements that Penny Peel has got, those partnerships that Penny Peel has had, are processes that have escalated Penny Peel and grown Penny Peel and, had, and have been there, the key foundations of Penny Peel's success. Could it have been the other way around as well? Where, because of those contracts, British Muslim TV also kind of maybe benefited? British Muslim TV, like a lot of other TV stations you, you know you're associated with other tv stations is a, is a is an independent entity which is a business so business businesses make money and businesses profit is there something is there anything wrong with that you've got businesses so as a business the business does what the business does but the charity was an, has been an exclusive partner for mm -hmm. 20, for 10 years and has done an amazing job on there in terms of awareness, publicity, feedback, it's been phenomenal. So let's assume kind of <coughs> everything is a kind of mix up and misunderstanding and, you know, disgruntled employees. What we, what could, what would you like to say to people like hand on heart, you know, person to person, like what would you say to them like, about this whole penny appeal scandal as they call it? Look, there's, it's very misunderstood. What we as an organization is extremely, extremely misunderstood. And the reason I feel that one of the things that it is misunderstood because nobody's really cared to stop and see where the success is. If all these things, if all these things are happening, how would we be such a big organization? Do you know? What, do you know what I mean? That we've not. We've. There's not been a big organization that we've come in and then the organization has gone from a hundred million to zero. You've got an organization which has gone from a zero to a hundred million. How has that happened? You tell, you tell me, as a businessman, as a fellow entrepreneur, these things are impossible to have. You know, you talk to, we've had, we've had the most successful and we've had the, the biggest Muslims globally that have come and like been associated with Penny Peel, been associated with the success, seen the work on the ground, seen the offices and seen the way that it's, it, 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 it runs itself. And yes, there's been a lot of learnings. We've had a huge amount of learnings, but those learnings have come because we've actually been there and we've done what we've done. Do you know, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not that there's something that we've got in the theory and then we're going to go right and do it, or we've done it and we've, we're, not, we're not perfect. Do you know what I mean? We're not perfect. And my background isn't charity either. You asked me at the beginning. I'm a marketeer. So, I, I'm, a, I'm a graphic designer. <laughs> so do you wish you didn't start... Absolutely not. Never, ever in a million years. It's been the best thing that's happened to me. And for the nearly 50 million people that have benefited from Penny Peel, you ask them, ask the orphans that we sponsor, ask the widows that we look after, ask the children that have been educated, ask the people that we home around the world and here in the UK. And Penny Peel isn't me. Penny Peel is not me. Penny Peel is the hundreds, if not thousands of people that work for Penny Peel, that are the orange army that help the people. Penny Peel are the donors that believe in us, that give to us, and that help us do the work that we're doing. Okay, so look, I'm a very simple guy. I don't like to think I'm a complicated guy, and I'm going to ask you simple questions, and I hope, I guess you can give me some simple answers, like, how, I mean... Did you wish sometimes, or sometimes after all the negativity in media, do you not think, you know what, I should have just stuck to single Muslim? You know, I don't have to answer questions. You know, I can sleep in peace. You know, you know I can just go about my life <clears throat> in a very peaceful way. I mean, Penny Appeal brought you, as you're saying, a lot of tension and stress and I guess a no, lot to no, deal no. with. 
But pen, it's a journey, and I, I love, I love feeling alive. You know what I mean? I love feeling alive. Some people jump out of planes. Some people bungee jump. Some people do all sorts to to feel alive. And I think for me, being able to do something, being able to create the impossible, is sometimes uh, is 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 the thing to do. And you know. Every, every moment that we've done building this organization has been a dream come true. It's, it's absolutely been a dream come true. And I would, never, I would never change it for the world. So I guess, uh, well, what you're saying is you're standing by everything that you've done and, and, and you're kind of still behind Penny Appeal and you back it 100% and, and with your full heart. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, the people who know me know that I, I love and I'm passionate about what I do. Okay. I'm really, really passionate about what I do. And, and, and I'm peaceful within myself. Amazing. You know? And I get a, I get sleep, I get plenty of sleep. <laughs> I guess I'm going to get a lot of um, sticks, I guess, for being nice in this interview, but that's just who I am. I can't change who I am. No, no, you, yeah, you, these, these questions were not... <laughs> nice. No, but you've just asked me these questions and you, you can ask me whatever you like. It's not a problem. Um, so you're, you're launching a new book, I can see um, here. But you've also I mean, this launched... Before You Marry? Yeah, it's yes, a unfortunately, I guess this is not a book for me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, before you explain about this book, um, talk to me quickly, because we've literally, <clears throat> we've, we've been out of time for, for quite some time. Um, small Change, Big Difference. What made you write it? And then talk to us about this book. So Small Change, Big Difference is the Penny Peel story. Um, what made me write that was, again, it was the mi being misunderstood. A lot of people don't know who I am, what my journey is, and a lot of people don't know what the Penny Peel journey is. And the Penny Peel journey is not exclusively me. P Penny Peel journey is hundreds of people, a massive team of people um, in Wakefield. Anybody watching this that's interested is more than welcome to come and meet, meet the team there. And it's not about the, the success, it's about the highs and the lows, it's about the sacrifice, it's about the dedication, it's about the gains, it's about the losses. Um, and really, some of the people, colleagues of mine, is like, Adeem, you've, you've put everything into this book. And I said, I have, yes, I've put everything. But what about if somebody copies Penny Appeal? I said, it's brilliant. If somebody copies Penny Appeal, you know, what, what, what could be a better thing to do for us? You know, I believe in Sadhguru Jari. I believe in you know, helping other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can help through Penny Appeal. But if we can't help through Penny Appeal, then if somebody else puts up a, an organization called Pound Appeal, then Bismillah. And if you know, they've learned something from Penny Peel, then Allah will eventually reward us. Amazing. And what about us. this book? This is a book um, for single Muslims, uh, and it's called Read This Before You Marry, and it's a book by myself, co-authored by Dr. Musharraf Hussein, who's the uh, incredible man behind the English modern English translation of the Majestic Quran, uh, and it's out next month, and we're doing a tour at the moment uh, in... Uh, up and down the country in February. Uh, the tickets are available on our website and, and uh, links are on our social media. But it really is a passion of last 25 years with helping people getting married. And, and I've, what, I've, what I've realized is that the big challenge in our community is not necessarily connecting people to get married. One of the big challenges in our community is helping people and upskilling people and giving people the knowledge and the confidence on how to stay married. And, you know, marriage is a cornerstone of our society. Yeah. Marriage is half of our faith. And it's not half of our faith for nothing. It's half of our faith because it's a very, very important part, part of our faith. So when you say half of your faith, you've got to remember how much that is. You know, you've got your five daily prayers. It's a you've bloody your, hard part of the your, faith you've got, as you've well. Got, you've got zakat. Yeah, you've got your charity that you've got to give hard-earned money, going on hajj, you know, fasting in Ramadan. These are all very, very difficult challenges, you know. Uh, and then you've got marriage. So this this book is really a dedication to helping people to understand and to... And we've got a beautiful section at the end called The Marriage Navigator. So The Marriage Navigator is about asking yourself questions. There's no right or wrong question. Asking yourself questions about what you would like, you know, like, for, for example... So almost like after-sales support... <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. It's a, it's a, it's a pre-sale, isn't it? It's like, a, a look at this, think about this, think about what you want, think about what you're getting into. Because once you're into it, then you're messing with people's lives. You Absolutely. know what I mean? You're going to mess with your own life. You're going to mess with your, 
you know, your, your, your spouse's life. And there's going to be children, inshallah, involved as well. Absolutely. And extended families on both sides. Absolutely. Brother Adim, I've got four more questions and we're done. Quick fire, one answer, I guess, <laughs> or one or two words answer. Aside from uh, Penny Appeal, what's your favorite charity? What's my favorite charity apart from Penny Appeal? Yes, charity organization. Oh my God, this is quick fire, yeah? I give to every single charity, man. I love every single charity. Now come on, my, choose my, my, one. Now you have to choose one. <laughs> my, my favorite person in the charity sector has got to be Dr. Hani al Banna. The founder That's of Islamic, Islamic, Relief. Islamic, Islamic, Islamic Relief. Islamic Relief. But what, what, is, what Dr. Hani al Banna has taught me is it's not about a single charity. It isn't about a single charity or about a single cause. Charities across the board are brilliant, beautiful. People should give to any charity that's close to their heart. Bismillah, give. Nice. Who was the last person you, uh, you sent a text message to or, or WhatsApp message to? You. <laughs> no, it kind of been me. On the way here. <laughs> okay. Salam, brother. How are you? I was like, it's been a while. It's been, it's been, it's been years. It's been years. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite chocolate bar? My favorite chocolate bar has to be a Yorkie. Yorkie. And which celebrity influencer do you look up to? Celebrity, you man, I look up to you. No, 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 no. Look, this is a void. This is this this answer Omar, is not valid. Omar, Omar Suleiman is a great scholar. He's somebody that I listen to. He's somebody that I get a lot of inspiration from. Uh, he's somebody that I've listened to last Ramadan. I pretty much spent my whole of uh, Ramadan listening to him, and he inspires me a lot. I have in enjoyed this conversation, Thank and you. and I hope you have too. And I hope. I mean, I've learned a lot. Um, I've known you from before the show, but I guess um, today kind of put everything into a sequence. So thank you for sharing your story and I hope our viewers will also learn and Inshallah. enjoy this episode. Inshallah. Thank you. And this is it for today. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Side by Side with myself, your host, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman and our incredible guest, Adim Yunis, the founder of Single Muslim. If you have been enjoying, don't forget to hit that subscribe button because your subscription means a lot to us. It will help us stay motivated on this journey. And of course, if you have learned anything from this episode, share this episode with your friends and family. 